So we feed this into Sage, or we do the three by three determinant, right. yeah. um, and what we end up getting is T inverse minus three plus T. Right? Um, and so that is the determinant of that three by three minor of this. And so that forms a, a basis for um, what we call the, the first elementary ideal of the of the of the module associated of the module of Laurent polynomials that's associated with this um, with this knot, and the Alexander polynomial normalized in the way that we agreed to normalize it. What was the step that we had to add here to normalize it into what's typically called the Alexander polynomial? Just multiply everything by t, um, and that's going to give me one minus three t plus t squared. Most references in knot theory uh, will show that as the Alexander polynomial of the figure eight knot. So most references will have that as the Alexander polynomial. But I want to get, I want to make some more hay uh, out of this. So this is what we'll call delta of k. One of the main reasons that it would be called the Alexander polynomial is that polynomial denotes that we don't have negative exponents, mm -hmm. right? So polynomials, by definition, only have non-negative exponents. So we can't really call it the Alexander polynomial unless we do something about this t to the minus 1. Mm -hmm. But having it in this form, I want to make some mileage out of that. t to the minus 1 minus 3 plus t. What happens to this polynomial if I trade places with the t and the t inverse? If I interchange t with t inverse. So in place of t, I have t inverse. So I have t inverse inverse minus 3 plus t inverse. What's t inverse inverse? 2 inverse. Yeah. Minus 3 plus t inverse. It's the same thing. A few minutes ago, what did we say interchanging t with t inverse actually does at the level of our magic average system for oriented knots? It symmetric in what way? What are we really doing when t trades places with t inverse? Switching the directions of the Yeah, exactly. So what is this telling us? If I switch all the crossings in my figure eight knot, I get a knot whose Alexander polynomial is the same. Why is that not a surprise? We started, um, it was for one, it was in yes, oh, yeah. right, exactly. So we started with a knot, k, 4, 1, which we convinced ourselves a long time ago was amphichiral. Minus k is equal to k. In principle, a knot and its opposite will have different Alexander polynomials. If I trade places with t and, and t inverse, in general, I probably get a different polynomial out of this process. But for this particular example, we knew that k was associated with this t inverse minus 3 plus t, right? And that if I take the opposite, I end up with, it turns out, the same polynomial, but that's the case precisely because k is equal to the opposite of k. So two knots that are the same are always guaranteed to have the same Alexander polynomial because the Alexander polynomial is a knot invariant. It doesn't depend on the diagram, it just depends on the knot itself. So what we've convinced ourselves of, therefore, is, uh, let's write this as a theorem, if k is amphichiral, amphichiral, then, um, then we know k is equal to minus k on the one hand, right? That's what amphichiral means. But the theorem is then that um, some multiple of the Alexander polynomial, whichever multiple we need, and we just happen to discover the one that works here, some multiple of delta of k, uh, will satisfy f of t equals f of 1 over t. I don't have enough room to write that. Some multiple of the Alexander polynomial will be insensitive to the interchange of t with t inverse. 
And it just so happened that that was the version that we discovered by this 3x3 subdeterminant. It wasn't the Alexander polynomial because it wasn't normalized, but it was a multiple. It was the T inverse times the Alexander polynomial. It gives us this polynomial that has these nice symmetric coefficients. So the symmetry of the knot with respect to crossing changes is reflected in the symmetry of this polynomial, which I think is pretty cool. Right? It's telling us the same story uh, as the amphichirality told us. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that every knot whose polynomial satisfies this relationship will be amphichiral. We have an if-then going on here, right? Um, but we can at least get the contrapositive to tell us something. What's the contrapositive of this theorem? That would be the converse. Um, the contrapositive would negate both of those assertions. So if f of t is not equal to f of t inverse for any multiple, of delta of k, then what do we say about the knot? It's not. Yeah, it's not amphichiral. And the good part is, usually that's pretty obvious. The, the any multiple question sounds kind of daunting, but usually it's obvious just by looking at the coefficients. Um, we had, um, we had uh, Alexander polynomial for the trefoil last time. Um, let's take a look at that real quick to see if we can verify that in that case this contrapositive still holds. Um, so the trefoil doesn't actually demonstrate the contrapositive because for the trefoil the Alexander polynomial actually does have the symmetry uh, that we would be looking for. If you multiply this through by t inverse, t inverse minus 1 plus t is symmetric with respect to interchange of t with t inverse. Uh, and yet the trefoil is not amphichiral. So this illustrates that the converse of our theorem is not necessarily true. Um, but we can know the contrapositive for sure will always be true, namely that if I have a knot whose Alexander polynomial does not satisfy this symmetry, then that knot cannot be amphichiral. So this Indiana University table of knot invariants um, lets us really just browse the all sorts of different invariant information that's known about knots. Um, so this is upkeep. The upkeep for this is a couple of knot theorists at Indiana University. I guess one is at Indiana, the other one is a, must have been a collaborator. Um, so if I ask it for the knots with three to six crossings, and if I want to see their Alexander polynomial, I'll scroll down to polynomial invariance uh, and check Alexander polynomial, submit. So here are some Alexander polynomials uh, for a variety of knots. Um, and what we could get out of this, so the Alexander polynomials of all of these knots appear to be symmetrical with respect to that interchange of t with t inverse. And we just have to you know, shift the, the powers of t down a little bit, right? Uh, and then we see that there is symmetry. There's always symmetry in the Alexander polynomial. So that's concerning somehow, right? Because um, we know that not all of these knots are amphichiral. Um, these are the knots in the database from three crossings to six crossings. Um, let's just, for funsies, let's jump into some more complicated examples. What about 10 crossings? Um, so there should be a huge list of 10 crossing knots, Alexander polynomials for 20 of them. Um, and if I just pick one at random, let's say this one, um, 4, negative 11, 13, negative 11, 4. Symmetric, right? So something else is going on here, right? There's got to be something about the Alexander polynomial um, that is completely incapable of telling us whether or not it is amphichiral or not. Um, because every Alexander polynomial that we compute is going to have this symmetry with respect to the interchange of t with t inverse. It's not just the amphichiral knots that do that. Um, so what it turns out, I'm going to spoil kind of a little bit of the end of the story uh, here, because I think this is the right moment to do it, um, is that we do not, in knot theory yet, have a complete invariant that's capable of distinguishing a knot from its chiral opposite. That we don't have. Uh, we do have a complete invariant that's capable of distinguishing knots, all other features of knots except for the chiral opposite. Um, that is the invariant that we're in the process of studying right now called the fundamental quandle. And so this is the result 
um, um, fundamental quantile uh, is a complete invariant. Oh, sorry about that. Funny, because in the video it'll be fine. <laughs> the fundamental quantile of a knot is a complete invariant for knot, except it can't distinguish k from minus k. Which, for most knot theorists, is still pretty darn good. Um, because it just means that um, usually what we're trying to use a complete invariant to do um, is to take two knots that have the same number of crossings or something like that and tell them apart from one another. And usually the fundamental quantile is very sensitive uh, to that kind of thing. Um, and getting, getting this right just up to the, the k, k to minus k reflection is, is still really, really good. It gets us still as far to the finish line as, as we could expect to get. Um, so. The reason that our Alexander polynomials are always symmetric, it's a reflection of this principle, because we can distill the Alexander polynomial from the fundamental quantile. But the fundamental quantile is blind to the chirality of a knot, and therefore, so is the Alexander polynomial. It's not powerful enough to distinguish. Um, the other problem with the Alexander polynomial, the other problem with the Alexander polynomial um, is that it's not always the case that two different knots have different Alexander polynomials. So these are two nasty looking 11 crossing knots. Um, their crossing number is the same. Their bridge number is the same. Their unknotting number is the same. Their Alexander polynomial is the same. Um, and yet it does turn out that these two knots are different. Okay. So the Alexander polynomial is just one invariant that's associated with a knot that we can get out of the fundamental quantile, but we can get others. And as soon as we find one invariant that we can get out of the fundamental quantile that's different for two knots, then we know for sure those two knots are distinct. But however powerful the Alexander polynomial is, it's not powerful enough to distinguish these two nasty 11 crossing knots. Um, so the agenda for the rest of the semester is kind of let's, let's look at the fundamental quantile as, as much as we can. Let's try and understand it as best we can in its entirety, um, and then look at how we can get more information out of it, new kinds of invariants that are capable of distinguishing knots one from another. Um, and then that will give us as full of a picture as we can get uh, of how knot invariants work. But because the fundamental quantile is our object that we're going to be using, that means that nothing we do from here out is going to be capable of telling a knot apart from its opposite. But we can still get a lot of mileage uh, out, of, out of studying this structure.